All right, can everybody see my screen? I'll take that as a yes. Um, okay. Um, so I'm Ms. Bella Stefano, and today I'm going to be talking about interactions between prior knowledge and contextual information in visual working memory. So visual working memory is often studied by having people remember multiple items at once, and it's common to use complex stimuli for these tasks. Uh, but Using these kinds of paradigms might not be entirely useful if we don't understand the nature of visual working memory representations. So in this talk, I hope to convince you that the most boring version of visual working memory tasks, remembering a single item or a pair of items, is actually incredibly complicated, and understanding the nuances of these simple representations is a prerequisite for understanding higher set sizes and complex visual working memory tasks. So since memory is inherently noisy, both prior knowledge and contextual information increase memory fidelity. Um, this reliance results on systematic biases and the complexity of even simple visual working memory representations arises from influences and interactions between these biases. So it's kind of difficult to study these multiple sources of biases at the same time for a couple of reasons. One is because the size of the biases tends to be relatively small, and the other is that the uncertainty associated with single trimelligerence makes delineated sources very difficult. So in this set of studies, I'm going to use color as a case study to um, look at the interactions between visual working memory biases. And the reason that we are doing this is because color has many very many well-known long-term and short-term biases. So the first source of bias we were looking at is prior knowledge. Uh, knowledge of color categories inserts influence on maintained representations such that colors are remembered as more like their linguistic color category than they actually were, even in perceptually uniform spaces. And the other two sources of biases that we will look at have to do with contextual information. So the first contextual bias arises from the assumption of spatial temporal stability of the world. Um, the expectation that the same location at a different time will have a similar stimulus value results in serial dependence, such that subsequent responses are biased towards the immediate past. Um, and the second contextual bias has to do with the assumption that objects are separate or distinct. The visual system segments the world into distinct objects, and when two colors are remembered simultaneously, responses for a probed color are biased away from the other color that was present on the display. So um, we're introducing a novel iterated reproduction paradigm for memory of simple stimuli that aims to amplify biases, which will allow us to compare uh, the different sources of bias. So on each trial, it's a standard uh, continuous reproduction task. Subjects see a color for one second. They remember it over a one second delay and then are asked to respond what color they remembered using a continuous report color wheel. The novelty in this um, method is the introduction of iterated chains. So the idea is similar to the children's game of telephone or similar to iterated learning tasks, except we are doing it within subject. So on the first iteration, a subject sees a target color and produces a response. Um, <laughs> then many trials pass in between to wipe that trial from visual working memory. And then that response is used as the target of the next iteration and then the subject responds, and this process continues until we collect an iterated chain of 15 iterations. But if the subject's response is very different from the color that they um, saw, we will reject that response to impose a continuity correction, and the trial will be repeated. So these, uh, the length of the experiment actually varied for different subjects. <laughs> So in experiment one, we looked at prior knowledge, um, which is the bias of color categories. So we expect to see some sort of non-uniformity in the distribution. Um, consistent with previous results, when we show people a target distribution of uniform colors, their responses are significantly more non-uniform. Um, and this non-uniformity is exaggerated uh, by the iterated chains. So this is the distribution of final iteration responses. And you can see that this non-uniformity is similar to what we see in the overall data. Um, and we wanted to compare this to color categories. So we collected color uh, naming data using basic color terms. And that's the distribution over color space that we obtained on the bottom. Um, and as you can see, it's like pretty inconsistent when we superimpose them. Um, the inconsistencies are a little bit more apparent, 
This is not what we expected to find at all. We expected it to be consistent, but as you can see for the blue and green and the purple and pink regions, there are not distinct regions separated in memory as they are in the color naming data. Uh, so when we split up the iterated chains by each starting seed, which every subject started at the same place in color space, uh, we see that the responses are not having the kind of concerted drifting that you would expect if people were having the same behavior in their iterated chains. This could be due to noise, but it could also be uh, caused by individuals having their own idiosyncratic convergence patterns. So uh, to give you a sense of what an individual's data look like, I'm going to show you how the iterated chains for a single subject evolve across iteration. So around the circle is degrees on the color wheel and increasing iteration moves radially outward. Subjects started with 10 unique seed colors, and um, this is the starting position, so iteration zero, iteration one. And as the iterations progress, you can see that the iterated chains seem to avoid certain regions of color space and eventually appear to converge on other regions. Um, and we had each subject do two chains for each starting position, and they appear relatively consistent uh, to the first set of chains. Um, but when we look at the convergence patterns of different subjects, they differ significantly, and we uh, wanted to do an analysis of this. So we looked at the uh, average nearest neighbor distance. So the display on the left is significantly more clustered than the display on the right. If we take the distance between each color and its nearest neighbor on the color wheel and take the average, that will be smaller for the display on the left than that on the right. <laughs> So we computed this within subject for each iteration and uh, took the ratio of this average nearest neighbor distance to that which would be expected by chance. We also simulate global clustering by shuffling responses between subjects to break the link between subject and their iterated chains to see if the clustering is consistent between subject as well as within. So subjects started out maximally distant anti-clustered because the spaces, the seeds were uniformly spaced. Within individuals, the original um, we see that their responses become clustered over time, but this is not the case for shuffled data. Um, our results suggest that clustering we see within individuals is much stronger than between individuals. Um, so there are a number of possible explanations for this behavior, including individual differences in color categories. Uh, however, we suggest that the idiosyncratic clustering within individuals, as well as the overall inconsistency with linguistic color categories, could possibly arise from the interaction between biases from prior knowledge of color categories and contextual biases like serial dependence. So um, to look at the uh, contextual biases, I'm going to go through the procedure for inducing these biases in the iterated re reproduction parasign for both experiment one and ex experiment two and experiment three, and then present the results all together. So in experiment two, we um, induced a serial dependence, which will result in an attractive bias. To do this, we manipulated the stimulus value of the trial immediately preceding each iteration in the iterated chain, each participant completed two chains for each starting seed color, where each chain was always preceded by a stimulus 20 degrees clockwise, which is positive, or 20 degrees counterclockwise, which we're using negative, on the color wheel. In experiment three, uh, we looked at the biases that arise when people remember two items at the same time, which will result in a repulsive bias. Uh, and to do so, we similarly manipulated context of each iteration trial, where the iteration color was always accompanied by an anchor color, which was either uh, 20 degrees clockwise or 20 degrees counterclockwise on the color wheel. So here I'm going to present the results averaged across starting colors and all participants. So on the x-axis we have iteration and we're going to be looking at the position of each iteration on the color wheel relative to the starting color. Um, so we're using experiment one as a baseline to compare uh, the behaviors observed in experiment two and experiment three. Um, <laughs> so in this plot, blue is going to represent the chains that had a clockwise um, influence, so plus 20 degrees, and red is negative 20 degrees. So these are the serial dependence results. Um, and we see that there is a small attractive bias induced by our preceding stimuli. Uh, and here is the set size two results where we find a large repulsive bias when the iterated chains are repelled by accompanying stimulus. 
When we split our analysis up by starting color, we find that there's this very complex interactions between contextual biases and starting locations in color space. This suggests that memory biases from prior knowledge, which is dependent on stimulus-specific color, um, and contextual biases interact. Uh, this interaction could explain some of the strange results we found in experiment one, but much more work is needed to confirm that this is actually the case. So in conclusion, Sorry. In conclusion, biases from contextual information are larger than biases caused by prior knowledge. The repulsive bias of set size two is much larger than the attractive bias of serial dependence. And there's an interaction between contextual information and prior knowledge, such that contextual biases are modulated by the location of a specific stimulus. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that even though we think we understand memory, uh, even the most boring memory tasks are incredibly complicated. Uh, so thank you for your attention. That's all I have. And thank you to my advisors in my lab. Okay, thank you, Isabella. Uh, great talk. Uh, I'm just checking the Q&A session to see if there are any questions. Okay, so uh, while people are typing their questions. I have some uh, questions for you. So uh, basically uh, you talk about the uh, individual differences in those, you know, like drifting. So I was wondering, uh, basically I have uh, two questions. So one is that, uh, did you see any like gender differences, you know, in terms of the clustering? Um, I didn't look at gender differences. I did collect um, information about what people's native languages and it kind of split up naturally into half of the people spoke English, native English, and half of the people spoke non-native English and there were no differences between that group, but that's interesting. Maybe I will look at gender differences. Okay, so we have a question from Klaus. Uh, the question is, if sequential effects create different trajectories, why are the two replications within the same individual so consistent? Uh, I'm sorry, could you? Oh yeah, so uh, you can also, can you open the Q&A? Yeah. You can see that question from Klaus. So the sequential effects. Why, why are they so consistent? Um, we didn't actually look at the consistency within individuals in experiment two and experiment three. We were just looking at whether there was going to be an interaction of the all, overall biases. Um, so that is a very interesting question, but we didn't collect enough data within individual to do that kind of comparison. Okay. But if I may follow up on that, you said, I think, if I got you correctly, uh, in experiment one, you said that every subject went through the same iteration sequence twice. And within subjects, you found that they did reproduce each other's trajectory, uh, their own trajectories very well, although presumably the sequential mm -hmm. effects were different in those two replications, right? So right. that looks to me like the sequential effects cannot have had a big influence on the trajectories. Uh, absolutely. I mean, like even the, just the previous trial might not have an effect, but the thing is that to induce a uniform target distribution, we had a semi-random algorithm generating trials. And since across iteration, people were clustering, uh, in their iterated chains, the filler trials were like systematically chosen to be not in those clusters, which is why I think the global distribution of trials presented, at least like in some local sliding window, has some effect on how people's chains move. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question from Brad. So uh, he asks uh, if you have tried some uh, dynamical tractor analysis. Um, yeah, I actually think that a lot of this data is very consistent with that um, framework and we are hoping to work on some models for that. Unfortunately, some of our data collection uh, was postponed because of COVID, but that's definitely on the to-do list. I, a lot of the stuff that's going on here, I think, is incredibly consistent with attractive and to, If I can, to follow up related to Klaus's point, it seems like the individual attractor landscapes are quite um, uh, potent, yeah? Whereas the, um, the sort of local in time context is relatively uh, smaller, at least uh, quantitatively, relative to the, the sort of life experience that your subjects bring to the lab when you, that's, that's the, the big drift that you see, 
would be present regardless of your uh, the, the manipulations in your test, right? Yeah, yeah. But um, one of the things that was interesting about it is that uh, it does depend where in color space you start. So it's like the global priors are very strong in certain regions, but in other regions, these local effects can dominate even more. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that the global priors within an individual play right. a big so, role. So you could then... probably, you could quantify that in terms of distance from the nearest attractor basin. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. What, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do think that the green and blue um, mixing up between linguistic color categories actually has to do with something specific in this color space where the attractor basins of green and blue overlap significantly. And so a lot of chains are getting caught in that region and just oscillating between the two right. uh, linguistic right. color.